Welcome to our English worship this morning. Four weeks ago, we began a new sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. Where can we find the Lord's Prayer in the Bible? The answer is in Matthew 6, right in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. What is Matthew 6 about? Matthew 6 is, is about praying and living. Now, we can summarize Matthew 6 with three points, two negative points and one positive point. The two negative points are, do not pray and live like hypocrites, and do not pray and live like the Gentiles. So how should we pray and live? We should pray and live like true children of God. And more graphically, uh, we can summarize it this way. There are three ways to pray and two ways to live. If you pray like the hypocrites, you will pray to receive man's praise and you will lose God's special gift for you in secret, and that is his righteousness. And if you pray and live like the Gentiles, seeking after the treasure of this earth, then you will lose God's kingdom and his heavenly treasures. Remember, the objective of this sermon series is to biblically build and rebuild our prayer life. Everyone prays. Every church prays. But what do we pray for? And that's more important, even more important than how often do we pray? How much do we pray? So the very objective, why we go through this series, is so that we can build a biblically informed prayer life. So for each sermon, I hope to draw one central application to build up a prayer list, a biblical prayer list. So from our first sermon, Open Our Eyes That We May Pray, part one, we get this application. That is the most <coughs> important prayer of all. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And it's a prayer that you don't just pray once, you pray numerous times every day in your life. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Then we have the second application, store up treasure in heaven. Pray every day that we may store up treasures in heaven. Pray every day that we may set our mind on things above. The third prayer from last week, pray that not uh, that what I will, but what you will. The first application is to seek after God's righteousness. The second application is to seek after God's kingdom. And the third application is to pray like Jesus in the Garden of Eden, not my will, but yours be done. So today we are at part two of our Father in heaven. What will we learn to pray? What will we learn about the Lord's Prayer? Let me take you to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven. If you have been with us the past two sermons, you should know that Jesus has centered his kingdom teaching on the fatherhood of God. Even though by the time of Jesus, some Jews began to address God as Father, when you go back to the Old Testament, you will find only 14 references to God as the Father. 14 references in 39 books of the Old Testament, 929 chapters of the Old Testament, 23,141 verses of the Old Testament. Only 14 times referring to God as Father. Then here in Sermon on the Mount, in three chapters of Matthew, chapter 5 to chapter 7, Jesus already exceeded the number of times the Old Testament addressed God as Father. Jesus used uh, God, uh, referred to God as a Father 17 times in three chapters of Sermon on the Mount. And in total, Jesus referred to God as Father more than 60 times in the four Gospel. Jesus is making the fatherhood of God the very center of his kingdom teaching. But what does it mean for us to call God our Father? And it's definitely not from your cultural leaning and say, oh, you know, Father means this and that. No, you have to derive that meaning from the scripture, from the Old Testament especially. So there are five pictures I want you to remember when you pray our Father in heaven. There are 
a total of five pictures. Four pictures came from the Old Testament, and one final picture comes from the New. Now, last week we already have looked at picture one, two, and three, and this week we'll continue to complete the Father puzzle with the final two picture. Picture number one, if you may remember, from Second Chronicle. Uh, chapter twenty-nine, verse ten to thirteen. What is it about? It's about David rejoice in the father's temple. Remember that is one of the our father passage in the Old Testament. There are only three our father passages in the Old Testament, and that is one. David in his prayer to give thanks to God for giving them the temple. Why? Because the temple will bring about the forgiveness of sin. If there was one man who need that forgiveness, that's David. So he looked forward. He rejoiced in God's giving them the temple. The second passage、uh, is from Isaiah sixty-three and sixty-four. There are two appearances of our Father. It is、uh, Isaiah's lengthy prayer, praying to our Father to redeem us from our sins. That's the second picture. And then the third picture we look at last week is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed, "Abba, Father." Now today we love to pray, Abba Father. We cry out to God, Abba Father, without thinking about His meaning. We are able to pray, Abba Father, only because someone else prayed in the Garden of Eden on our behalf, Abba Father. And by praying that prayer, He went for us to the cross to make it possible to call call God our Father. Today we will continue with picture number four and number six. Number four is from the book of Exodus, and then number five is from the book of Second Samuel. What are they all about? Let me give you a preview. Number four is "Let my son go, that he may serve me." Let my son go, that he may serve me. And number five is "Kingdom of my son lasts forever." The kingdom of my son will last forever. Remember what we are trying to do. We are trying to understand the meaning of praying our Father in heaven, because we pray that every day, our Father in heaven, without understanding what we are actually praying. So we want to know what does it mean when we call God our Father, and we want to know what does it mean for us to be children of God, to be praying as children of God. So we have number one and two. Number one and two are interesting because number one and two we have our Father came out of the mouth of a worshiper. Came out the mouth of David. Came out the mouth of、uh, Isaiah. We are addressing God as our Father. But number four and five is interesting. Number four and five, what we are looking at today, is God calling His people. God calling His chosen King, my Son. So from that two texts, we hear closely what does it mean for us to be God's Son, and what should we be praying for as a result of being. The children of God, being sons of God. Now, in the end, you will find that all the New Testament passages are actually prophecies seeking Jesus and finding fulfillment in Jesus. Jesus at Gethsemane, Jesus at the cross. Without Jesus going to the cross, all the rest of one, two, five, four, five are meaningless. They 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 will not be able to find any fulfillment. There's no. Meaningful answer to those prayers, but with Jesus at the cross, with Jesus crying out in Garden of Gethsemane, we now see the fulfillment of it all. So, with all that in mind,、uh, I want to take you to look at how the prophecies of Exodus and Second Samuel will be fulfilled in Christ. Let's go to Exodus first. Exodus chapter four, verse twenty-two. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, "You is referring to Moses." Then you, Moses, shall say to Pharaoh, "Thus says the Lord: Israel is my firstborn son." This is the first place in the Bible, the first place in the Bible where God Himself would address the people as "my son." So if、uh, if the people of God is His son, then God is their father. You see that. So remember, the Israelites were actually slaves in Egypt. Yet Yahweh, the covenant God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, remember them. So He called them, "My son, my firstborn son." Verse twenty-three. 
and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your Pharaoh's firstborn son. You see, because uh, the, uh, they were the Israel. Lies were God's son, God's firstborn son. God demanded Pharaoh. Now you have to think about Pharaoh, not just an, as another kind of a ruler. If Pharaoh is the power figure in the ancient world. He is the most powerful man. So God is issuing an ultimatum to this most powerful figure in the ancient world. God said, let my son go. It's not just let my people go, let my son go. But notice the purpose of their release. Let my son go that he may serve me. So it's not just to set them free. It's set them free so that they may serve Yahweh. How interesting. As if Yahweh needs somebody to serve him. Now that's a very important point. We'll, we'll come back to that later and then god said if you refuse to let him go and god knows that pharaoh will refuse to let him let them go so there would be a fierce battle there will be a fierce battle between pharaoh and yahweh behold i will kill your firstborn so this is exodus in a nutshell what is exodus all about well we may say that exodus is a story that moved from slavery uh, slavery to sonship. So Israel began as slave, but they will end up being God's son. So what does it mean to move from slavery to sonship? Now someone may say, well, Pastor, Pastor Lamb, that isn't that simple? You think about what's the opposite of slavery? To move from slavery to something else means to move from slavery to freedom. And that's why we usually think about that. But the question here is, is that what freedom looks like? You know, God set us free. God saved us from, uh, you know, this slavery so that we could be free to pursue my dream, our dreams. Now, remember what God said to Pharaoh. Let my son go so that what? He may pursue his dream. Let my son go so that he can enjoy life. No, let my son go that he may serve me. God did not save Israel for freedom, at least not in the modern sense of the word. People say that, well, God liked me to be free. God set me free so that I could be debt free. I could be free from entanglement of many uh, negative things so that I could now pursue my dream. I can live my life. I could, uh, you know, have self-actualization. Is that what that means? No, let my people go so that they may serve me. So I wonder if you have heard of this kind of uh, one kind, one brand of theology called liberation theology. It's very popular in some areas in the world that people study, study the Bible, and they, they found the book of Exodus. They are really excited about it because Exodus is about liberation, liberation from political, social, economic oppressions. So they like to study and say, oh, the God, you know, this Christian value, you know, so they let's work to, uh, for revolution, you know, to deliver people from political, from social, economic oppression. They read the, uh, the Old Testament as if it is the real thing. But even here in the Old Testament, pay attention to the, let my people go that they may serve him. That is not liberation theology. God free Israel for service, for service to God and God alone, for service to Yahweh. You see, the Israelites, they were already serving in Egypt. They were very busy. They were under slavery. So the question now is, who should they serve? And who would they serve in the end? So the story of Exodus is now a movement from serving Pharaoh to serving Yahweh, you know? Service will be included in the final picture. Service will be included in that freedom picture. But who will they serve? Would they serve Pharaoh or would they serve Yahweh? So Israel should no longer serve Pharaoh in Egypt. Rather, Israel would now move to serve Yahweh. Where, if not in Egypt? Now, if you keep reading the book of Exodus, you will say, well, they will serve Yahweh in the wilderness. 
and then crossing their wilderness, they will enter into the promised land. They will serve Yahweh ultimately in the promised land. Now, that's correct. But let me give you another answer. They will serve God in his kingdom. They will serve God in his kingdom. That's why the giving of the Ten Commandments is so important. It's right there in the midpoint of Exodus. Because the Ten Commandments actually symbolize the kingdom of God. So I want you to keep in mind uh, the importance of the Ten Commandments for now because we'll get back uh, to this later. So here, on the surface, we see a battle between Pharaoh and Yahweh, you know, about the people of Israel. But the people of the ancient world, the first audience of this book, would not look at this context this way. They would look at this context very differently. The context is not between Pharaoh and Yahweh, but between the Egyptian god, Egyptian idols, and Yahweh, the only true god. You see that? Because the battle is not between a human king and the divine god. It is between the false idols and false gods of Egypt versus Yahweh, the God of Israel, the only true God. So on the one hand, Yahweh had promised to deliver Israel from Egypt. But from another angle, Israel had to decide for themselves which God, which God they will serve. You see, that is the ultimate battle. So when we read Exodus carefully, and we observe there are two battles on two levels. One is the external battle, and one is the internal battle. One is the physical battle, the other one is the spiritual battle. As an old saying goes, it's easy to get Israel out of Egypt. It's really that easy. It's not any trouble for Yahweh, but it's far more difficult. It's far more difficult to get Egypt out of Egypt. Israel. So we see that battle, that even after the exodus, uh, that Israel cannot forget Egypt. That's why you have the golden calf. The golden calf is not some new creation. The golden calf is probably molded after a certain Egyptian god, a combination of the Egyptian god, because they miss Egypt so much. And there are a series of episodes of rebellion. And the very nature of the rebellion is like, oh, you know, why we come here to the wilderness to die? We remember all the food, all the barbecue we have, the hot pots that we used to enjoy in Egypt. They are thinking about many reasons why they should not follow Yahweh, so that they may go back to Egypt. The battle, the true battle, is between the false idol and gods of Egypt versus the one true God of Yahweh. So while God was more than willing to be their father, think about that. Israel is my son. While God is more than willing to be their father, the question remains, did Israel want God to be their father? Do they want to be God's son? Which gods, which God would they choose to serve? And which gods and which God would you choose to serve? You see, this is the most important questions in everyone's life, that you have to decide who you are going to serve, yourself, uh, the gods of this world, or Yahweh, the one and true God. And that decision carries severe consequences. I would say eternal consequences. Now, you see, in the book of Exodus, the choices, their choices, will lead to two sets of ten. Either end them with the ten place, or you will end with the Ten Commandments. So if the Israel, if Israel chose to serve Egyptian God, they will end up receiving what? The ten place. But if they chose to follow and serve Yahweh and Yahweh only, what would they receive? Well, they will receive the Ten Commandments. Now someone may say, but Pastor Lamb, seriously, both are not very appealing to me. I certainly don't want to die. I certainly don't like that penalty of the Ten Place. But neither do I want to live a life full of restriction under the Ten Commandments. Is there a third choice? Well, there's no third choice. The choice is actually between punishment. It's not between punishment 
and restriction. The choice is actually between eternal judgment and the blessed life in God's eternal kingdom. So the Ten Commandments are not restrictions. You see that we often do not understand that. We think about, oh gosh, you know, just the fourth commandment, you, you, you shall keep the Sabbath, is already, you know, changing. You know, I, I mean, I so wanted to sleep in on Sunday, and then you have the fourth commandment. I should keep the Sabbath. I hated that already. And then we have the other nine commandments. Now, if you look at the commandment like that, if this is your impression about the commandment, to restrict you, put a burden on you, you, you don't know God, you don't understand why the Ten Commandments were given. The Ten Commandments were not restrictions that God imposed on Israel. They are rather a symbol of their being welcome into the blessed kingdom of God. The thing about that, when you immigrate from one country to another, you are essentially entering from one set of law to another. Now, you are not going to move into another country where it's lawless. You understand? So the law symbolized the kingdom. So when Israel received the Ten Commandments, when God gave them the Ten Commandments, God is welcoming them into his kingdom. And the law of God are not burdensome. Uh, the Bible tells us that with the Spirit of God giving us new hearts and new life, the law of God become a joy to give. And you may also think of the Ten Commandments as medical equipment, like neck braces, arm braces, leg braces, to keep us from further spiritual damage. Think about that. We need that medical equipment so that we could be on the path to recovery. So I want you to think about all that. And with that, let's return to Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. So then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. I have created you, Israel. I have chosen you, and I will save and sanctify you. I will heal you of your sins, of your idolatry. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn. So how would... Yahweh deliver Israel uh, from Egypt. Well, he will do it through the 10 plagues, and especially the 10th place, the last plague of it all. God will visit Egypt. God will bring about death and judgment, complete judgment. Now, how would Israel escape this sweeping judgment? And the answer is by way of the Passover lamb. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, tell all the congregation of Israel that every man shall take a lamb for a household. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Verse 6, Israel shall kill their lamb at twilight. Then they shall take some blood and put it on two doorposts and lintel of the houses in which they eat it. Verse 12, for I will pass through Egypt and I will strike all the firstborn, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now notice, on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. God is not executing a judgment just on Pharaoh and the Egyptian. He is targeting the gods of Egypt. God hates the gods of Egypt. God hates all the false idols. And of course, not only will the idol be destroyed, all the worshippers of the false god of the idol will be destroyed as well. So that's why it's so important for Israel to rid their attachment to Egypt, to get rid of all the false gods and idols among them. Now you can see that spiritual significance with us too, right? That if God is like that, he hated the idols and false gods. He demands them to be rid of, and in the same way, he will say the same to the Christian today. Verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you, and when I see blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will be for you when I strike the land of Egypt. So here we see the establishment of the Passover, the most important festival 
on the Jewish calendar. It's a Passover by the Lamb. It's a Passover by the blood of the Lamb. So Exodus is therefore best summarized as out of the house of idols. Now, if you have just do one line summary of what Exodus is about. Now, don't talk about slavery and freedom. Talk about out of the house of idolatry, out of the house of idol. It's a journey from death to life. It's a journey from eternal death in the fire of hell to eternal life in the blessed kingdom of God. And there was a covenant of life. There was a covenant of life with Moses as the mediator between God and man. Uh, and it was also a great escape, a great escape made possible by the Passover lamb. Now, all this imagery should draw you to the New Testament. All this imagery finally lead you to Jesus Christ. To us Christians, all these are shadows of the real thing. Ultimately, everything flowed to Jesus Christ and his cross. In Christ and his cross, we find the greater and the ultimate Moses. In Christ and his cross, we find the greater and the ultimate Passover lamb. And so this then is the Christian life according to Exodus. The Christian life according to Exodus. We have to escape from idol. Of course, we are not escaping from Egyptian gods and idol. You ask you what are the Egyptian gods and idol? You probably cannot even name one. Well, but you know there are many idols of our world. You are very familiar with the idols of our world. The application to us Christians are not to is not to escape from Egypt, but rather to run away from money, sex, and power. This is the negative part, but what's the positive part? To seek to serve God. Let my son go that they may serve me. Let my son go from Hong Kong, from the value of Hong Kong, from money, sex, and power, from this world. Let my children go so that they may serve me and my kingdom with all their hearts and souls and mind and strength. So this is what it means when we pray our Father in heaven. Wow, there's a lot of things jammed into one, right? The whole Exodus story jammed into one. When we pray our Father in heaven, when we pray as children of God, what do we pray for? We're praying to be liberated from idolatry. True sons of God flee from false God and idols of this world. True sons of God bow before the Lamb of God and worship true sons of God live to serve God and his kingdom alone. Let my son go that they may serve me. So finally, now we can add another item to our prayer list. How wonderful it is. What is that prayer list now? Look, how does it look like? Point number four, love the lamb, forsake all idols. Now that becomes something we can pray for every day, that we may love the lamb and forsake of idol. Now this is picture number four from Exodus. Now we still have one more picture to look at. And that picture is from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Kingdom of my son lasts forever. That takes us to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Let me read to you. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. You, your, referring to King David. When David, when you are about to die, I will raise up your offspring after you, who will come from your body, and he will establish his kingdom. Verse 13. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And you see that? Verse 14, you know, we are talking about our father in heaven, right? What we'll be thinking about our father in heaven, you see here is a reference to God as a father. God said, I will be to him a father. It's not even man pleading with God to be their father. It is God saying, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So if you are a Jew, if you are a Jew and follow Jesus' teaching to pray our Father in heaven, you couldn't help but think about this text, 
Seriously. I mean, we, we don't think about it because we're not familiar with the Old Testament. But if you are a Jew and you're familiar with the Old Testament, when God say, now, beginning tonight, you address God as our Father in heaven, you immediately think about this text. The Davidic covenant God promised to David, and not only to David, to all his people, because everyone will benefit from this sonship. Everyone will benefit from this kingship. Now, here's a question. Who is this son? Who is this son? Who is this son of David? Well, the Jews will no doubt think about Solomon, right? And after all, Solomon was the son of David. Solomon was the son of David who was chosen to build the first temple. Everybody knows about that. And Solomon's kingdom, as far as we remember, was strong and prosperous at least for a time. But here we find a phrase, a phrase that makes us pause. The phrase is that, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. What? Forever. Not for 40 years, not for a, a number of years, but for ever. That phrase forever makes us pause, makes us wonder. How can this promised king be Solomon? In fact, this promised king cannot be Solomon. What book are we reading? We're both reading from the book of Samuel. Biblical scholars tell us that by the time the book of Samuel were completed, Solomon's kingdom has already been divided, divided into the north and the south. In fact, some biblical scholars even believe that when Samuel was completed, it was the time of the exile. Now, if the book of Samuel was actually completed during the time of exile, then what does that mean? It means the temple was no more because Jerusalem would have been in ruin and the kingdom was no more because they have been captured. They have been destroyed by the Babylon. Everything is gone, totally gone. So Solomon could not be their son because the temple was gone. And the kingdom was no more. So we have to keep waiting, keep looking for the son of David, the son of God, to appear. 2 Samuel 7, 16, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever, 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 forever. It cannot be Solomon. Well, the Jews are still waiting today to us Christians. We know that the promised son of David, the promised son of God, is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how in Jesus Christ, sonship and kingship became one. When you say that Jesus is the son of God, it's another way to say he is the chosen son of David. He is God's promised king and savior, of this world, sonship and kingship are inseparable from each other. Therefore, when we turn to the life and ministry of Jesus in the four gospel, uh, there are two things we observe. On the one hand, we hear God call Jesus, my beloved son. We hear Jesus teaching us to address God as father. The sonship is all over the place in the gospel. But on the other hand, not only sonship, we hear kingship. We hear the gospel writer keep reminding us of Jesus is the promised king of the Jews. He is the king of Israel. He is the savior of the world. Sonship and kingship together, not just for one generation, but forever. Sonship and kingship forever. So I want to take you through the gospel of Matthew to see how kingship and kingdom that theme chained together Jesus' whole life. Now remember, Matthew is where we have the Lord's Prayer. Matthew is where Jesus keeps telling us to address God as Father. But I already told you, sonship and kingship cannot be separated together. So another way to read Matthew is not through sonship, but through kingship. And we begin here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. An extraordinary, extraordinary opening. It begins like this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. What an extraordinary opening. Why? Who, who is Jesus? Well, he is son of David. He is son of Abraham. How could David be ahead of Abraham? 
We're talking about seniority here. How could Jesus be son of David? Did you not make a mistake? He should be called the son of Abraham and son of David, but he began with son of David. Why? Because David was the king and Abraham was not. He's trying to tell us who Jesus is. He will be born the king. So verse uh, 5 of chapter 1, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And there was nowhere in the genealogy when, uh, you know, Matthew will put down the professions, the occupation of Jesus' forefathers, except here, why he wants to tell us who Jesus is. And if you are familiar with the genealogy of Jesus, you will hear that refrain at the end. So all the generation from Abraham to David were 14 generations. From David to deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. Why 14? Because 14 is the number for David. When you break David's name into alphabet, what you add up together is 14. 14 is David's number. David is the king. Jesus is the king. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judea, in the day of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? This is Jesus' birth story. Look at that. Jesus has a nickname. He was born the king of the Jews. I don't know whether you have a nickname when you were born. Maybe your family is super rich, and they will call you the super baby or something like that. But this is not a, a rich family, but he will be born the king of the Jews. And if you are familiar with Matthew, you know that he will not just be born the king of the Jews, he will die as the king of the Jews also. But before we get to that, get to the end, I want you to listen carefully to Jesus' core message. We have mentioned that Jesus' core message has the fatherhood of God. We have mentioned that Jesus' core message has our sonship. But now look at the other way. Jesus' message is full of the theme of kingship and kingdom. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he said to them, Follow me. Immediately, they left their net and followed him. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, because the king of the kingdom has come, and I am the king of the kingdom. He was not ashamed of that at all. Repent and follow me. Why? Because I'm the promised forever king. I'm the only one worthy of your following. So you can quit all your Twitter following. And there was only one person that is worthy of our following. And how? So you left behind everything that you had to follow him. He is a forever king. Verse 23, and he went through all Galilee teaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, chapter 9, verse 35, And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Now, these two verses are almost verbatim, right? Except for one thing. Uh, one, the first verse was in Galilee. Well, Galilee is a small place. Galilee is where Jesus was from. It's in the north, in the, the small villages. Now the kingdom is, in chapter 9, expanding. It was going beyond Galilee to some other cities, and villages, the gospel of the kingdom. What is Jesus doing? He's expanding the kingdom of God. Now, what does it mean to be preaching, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom? Now, gospel literally means good news, but it's not good news in the ordinary sense. Now, some of you remember from our study of the gospel of Mark. Many years ago, when I first began my first sermon in Mark, I give you this technical definition, worthy of memorization. The term gospel is not good news in the general sense. In the Greco-Roman world, gospel was a technical term. The gospel refer specifically to the public proclamation of the birth, the enthronement, the victory and return of a king. To preach the gospel is to preach about a king. To tell the story of the gospel is to tell the story of a king, that the king is Jesus Christ. And to preach about Jesus Christ, to preach about the king is to preach repentance. To re repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and submit yourself wholeheartedly 
to Jesus the King. So in chapter 4, verse 23, we have Jesus proclaiming the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now look at the, uh, uh, the four, uh, chapter, chapter 24. It should be chapter 24, verse 14. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world to all nations, then the end will come. Now, if you have a chance to go back and study the Gospel of Matthew, you will realize that the term, the Gospel of Kingdom, appear only three times. One in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, one in the middle of Jesus' ministry, and one at the end of Jesus' ministry. The first one appears in chapter 4, then in chapter 9, and finally in chapter 24, not 14. In chapter 24, at the end of Jesus' ministry, once again, the term, the Gospel of the Kingdom, show up. What's Jesus' whole ministry about? It's about the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel is the story about a king, and Jesus is the king, the king who will bring to us the kingdom of God. Who is Jesus? He is the son of God. He is the son of God who keep addressing God as father. He is the son of God who keep teaching us to address God as the father. Who is Jesus? He is the son of David. He is God's promised king of Israel. So what is Jesus' mission on earth? Is to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. How would Jesus usher in the kingdom of God? Or did he just uh, keep preaching and preaching and that the kingdom of God will come? Well, apparently not. He had to do something more. He will usher in the kingdom of God through a meal, through the Passover meal. He is taking us back again to Exodus and his last supper on earth. So this is what we will read at the end of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 27. And so Jesus took a cup, saying, This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So this cup is linked to the kingdom. This cup will take you into the kingdom. This cup is about his going to the cross, the blood. And so the blood, by the blood of the lamb, he will accomplish forgiveness of sin. By the blood of the son of God, he will establish an eternal covenant, bringing us into God's kingdom. So here we have a fulfillment of the Davidic Covenant in 2 Samuel. Who is Jesus? He is the Son of God. Who is Jesus? He is the Son of David. What did he come to do? Well, if you remember from 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel reads something like this. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne, the throne of his kingdom forever. What will he do? He will build a house for me. Did Jesus build a house for God? We know Solomon Build one. And then it got destroyed. But did Jesus, the promised son of David, build a temple for God? And the answer is yes, yes, and yes. So remember what happened in the final week of Jesus' life. He came to this place and he prophesied about this magnificent, this is not the first temple. It's not even the second temple. It's like the third temple. And then when this temple you know, at this magnificent temple, Jesus prophesied this temple will be destroyed. And then Jesus talked about himself, destroyed this temple. He's referring to his own body. And I will rebuild one, not make with hands. And through his resurrection, there will be a true temple, one temple that will bring about the forgiveness of sin. Jesus will build that eternal temple and his kingdom will be forever and ever, because he is the king of the Jews. Just then we read about Jesus being born the king of the Jews. At the end of Matthew, we see him dying as the king of the Jews. And over his head, chapter 27, verse 17, they put the charge against him, which reads, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. So the king of the Jews appear only in two places in Matthew, once in chapter 2 and the other time in chapter 27. You see that is an inclusio. The, the, king, the king of the Jews breaks the entire story. Matthew is a book about the Son of God becoming the king 
of the Jews. It began with the king of the Jews. It ends with the king of the Jews on the cross. And Matthew is trying to tell us, Jesus is trying to tell us that through the cross, through the king of the Jews, we too can become children of God. How can we call God our father? It is because we are in Christ, and in Christ we are sons of God. In Christ we are co-heir of God's glorious and eternal kingdom. We are not just sons, we are also princes, princesses of God's eternal kingdom. Now before you begin daydreaming about what life is going to be like as sons and daughters of God, as princes and princesses in God's glorious kingdom. I want to remind you something about the nature of Jesus' kingdom. Here's one of my favorite verses and most important one in the New Testament. This is Jesus before Pilate. John chapter 18, verse 33. So Pilate said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Now remember, Matthew's main theme is Jesus is the king of the Jews. If Matthew had been there before Pilate, remember, would raise his arm and say, yes, yes, I wrote it in my gospel. He was born the king of the Jews and he will die as the king of the Jews. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus will raise his arm and say, yes, I am. However, see, Jesus added something. I am the king of the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. In fact, he repeated it Twice. He said it twice. And my kingdom is not of this world. Our Father is in heaven. Our Father belongs to another world. To belong to God's kingdom, the kingdom is not of this world, but of another world. It's a different kind of kingdom. So in Jesus Christ, you and I are sons and children of God. In Jesus Christ, we're princes. And we're princesses of God's kingdom. However, do not expect your life to become like the princes and princesses of this world. And we like to watch documentary and uh, you know uh, and and let's watch and listen to this story about the glamorous lives of the rich and famous in this world. And we say, "Oh, now we are children of God." And so our life could be changed, and we can come before God to ask anything, and He will give. Uh, he will be more than willing to give it to us. Now, if you are thinking like that, you are deadly wrong. Why? Because my kingdom is not of this world. There are so many Christians who are misguided by this because they choose to ignore John chapter 18, verse 36. I want you to listen carefully to Paul's uh, saying about our life as the children of God. And this is how Paul described the life of the children of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, there are only three places in the New Testament where Abba, Father appeared. The first time was Jesus crying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then in Galatians, which we read about it, we cry out with the spirit of adoption, Above all, this is the third place. This is the third place. And there are many people who, who love this verse. They say, well, you did not receive a spirit of slavery. You are not slave to fall back into fear. But you have received a spirit of adoption as son. You are sons. So you should go to the Father with boldness. Have you heard about a story like that? That we should learn to pray boldly. We should knock at God's door because we are not slaves anymore. You know, how dare a slave to go to the master and ask for extravagant things? You, you won't be able to do that, right? But you are not slaves anymore. You are sons. So as sons, you can go to God and knock and say whatever you want and the Father will be more than happy to give you Father, Abba, Father. Is that how this verse, what this verse means? Of course not. Because there is a second verse that continues. Listen to what Paul said about crying out of our Father. Paul continued in Romans 8, 16, The Spirit himself bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God, again, children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. 
Now here, the Greek word provided probably could be better translated as sins. So this is what God, uh, uh, you know, what Paul is saying to us. What is, uh, what is the reality of being children of God? The reality of being children of God is that you will suffer with Him. So we are children of God since we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Paul is writing to a group of Christians who are suffering. And Paul takes that suffering as a given. Suffering is a given. Suffering for the sake of the gospel. I'm not talking about illnesses and all that. I'm talking about suffering for the sake of the gospel is a given, a, not a possibility, not a condition. Now, some of you remember this verse from Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. For it has been granted to you, the Philippians, that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Suffering is a gift. It's a gift of the kingdom of God. What will the children of God experience in this life? Well, there's one thing that's very sure. They will suffer for the kingdom of God. They will suffer for the sake of the gospel. And that's exactly what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. I'll take you back to the Sermon on the Mount because that's where the Lord's Prayer is, right? So what does it mean to be children of God? This is how Jesus said it. This is part of the Beatitudes. Uh, chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, we love this. We love this. We say, well, let's be peacemaker. Let's bring people together, you know, build a better world. Then we'll be called sons of God. Well, look at the next verse. The next verse is all connected. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But someone may say, but Pastor Lam, that is for next week. You know, we're preaching through Beatitude, that eight-week series. No, you see, you can't do that. You can't do that. Some of you have heard me preach on Beatitude, and I say, the Beatitude are not dishes at Chinese banquet. If dishes at Chinese banquet, they come out one, you finish it, and then the next one comes. No, they are more like Korean side dishes. They all come as one set. And we know that they are one set because the first Beatitude begins with this is the kingdom of God. And the last one begins with this is the kingdom of God. It's an inclusio. The eight come together. So what Jesus is saying is, blessed are you, sons of God. What will happen to you? You will be persecuted for righteous sake. So it's all part of the package. What does it mean to be sons of God? What does it mean to be called to be sons of God? Yes, should we be peacemakers? Of course we should be peacemakers. How are we going to be peacemakers? We preach the gospel to the world. And along the way, as we are preaching the gospel to the world, don't expect everyone to like you. You will be persecuted for righteousness. And if this is not enough of evidence, the next verse should convince us. The next two verses goes like that. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. So now we can add one more prayer item to the last one. What does it mean to be children of God? What does it mean to be heirs, princes, and princesses of God's glorious kingdom? It means to suffer with him. And so that we may be glorified with Christ. Now let me combine the two together. This is what I have. What do we pray, having heard this long sermon? We pray that we will endure suffering and that we will follow faithfully the Lamb of God. Let's pray. Let's pray not according to our own preferences. Not pray. Let's pray according to the Word of God. Pray that we will not pray like the hypocrites. Pray that we will not pray and live like the Gentiles. Pray that we will pray and live like true children of God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we, um, there's so much we need to think through. That just one phrase, our Father in heaven, uh, that draw us into all sorts of directions. The modern psychology will teach us this and that. And uh, the false teacher of this world will misinterpret and urge us to ask boldly for anything of our heart's desires. Oh, no, we are true children of God. We don't do that. We stick to your word. We stick to 
the Old and the New Testament. We stick to Jesus' teaching, Apostle Paul's teaching, Isaiah's teaching, David's teaching. We stick to what we can see and hear in the Word. And your Word is profound. Your Word is deep. Your Word challenges the very reality, the essence of this kingdom. Your Word tells us that we are to live for another kingdom. And in that kingdom, everything got turned upside down. And that kingdom alone is true and lasting. So will you help us? Will you help us to be children of God, to flee from all idolatry, to serve you with our whole heart, and to suffer with you that we may be glorified with you? Thank you so much for being our good God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.